Well, hi there. This is Roger Horowitz of the Hagley Library with another episode of Hagley History Hangout, where we acquaint people with the collections that the Hagley Library has and some of the great scholarship that is coming out of that library by people who come in and use our collections. Uh, with me today is uh, an old friend, Jennifer Delton, who is professor of history at Skidmore College in New York State, who is the author of a, of a number of books uh, in the past. Uh, the most relevant for our conversation today is Racial Integration in Corporate America. Uh, she's also written uh, Making Minnesota Liberal and uh, Rethinking the 1950s. Uh, today, we're talking about the industrialists, uh, how the National Association of Manufacturers shaped American capitalism. Uh, so Jennifer, thank you for being willing to sit with us for a few minutes. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Roger. It's nice to be here. Well, Jennifer, let's just start by saying, you know, asking, why did you write this book? Why did you write a history of, of NAM? The, many reasons, but the most, the, the most um, pressing reason was that NAM's history had not been written. And because its papers are available at the Hagley, and it's one of the few business organizations that has a full set of archives, um, historians often study the NAM, but there's no full history of it. So when I was writing my book, Racial Integration in Corporate America, I, I used uh, the NAM's papers. Um, and I was looking for a book that would tell me, well, you know, who was in the corp, who was in this organization? What, um, what did it argue about? What was going on? What were their interests? Um, and there, no such book existed. So I made a note then that that was a great opportunity just to write a book that um, was about an organization that a lot of historians write about um, in other, in connection to other things but there had not actually been a complete history written of it. Um, and so that was my, actually that was my main reason. That was it. Um, did, you have, um, did you have a specific question or questions you wanted to ask of NAM as you had a chance to write this book? I mean, I know you've looked at the NAM paper before mm -hmm. for folks listening, Jennifer has been visiting Hagley for quite some time using our materials. <laughs> Um, but so you so in addition to saying there's a great big gap here and this is an important source, were there some things that particularly made you curious, things you want to tease out as you or emphasize as you wrote this book? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that was interesting to me was, you know, when you when historians first started writing about Nam, um, it it came way back. Um, well, no, actually, let me back up. That's not true. Historians have been writing about Nam and usually about labor issues. But um, William Appleman Williams and that whole um, crew of so-called revisionist historians that were interested in developing the thesis of American imperialism and American economic might around the world um, had, had really looked into NAM as a source of, you know, here, here's where it is. Businesses really are interested in expanding trade and they're on board for uh, the American imperial mission. And then, and then so there were there was a lot of work at the time about the early NAM in the 1890s um, and its interest in expanding trade. And then people seem to lose, lose interest in the globalization project uh, after that. Um, and people have looked at NAM for um, its anti-labor um, conservatism mainly. Um, but I did wonder what what happened with the globalization? Was was NAM on board with that? And I'd also seen other mentions, some articles that read I had read said that oh NAM was a um, a protectionist organization. And I thought, well, that's interesting because it started as an expand a trade expansion organization. Um, and so I was interested in tracing what happened with the globalization project that it's it began with in the 1890s. Um, and surprisingly, historians ha hadn't told that story. So I, that was definitely one of the key things I was interested in. Questions? Let, well, let's go back to the 1890s and develop that. I mean, you have, uh, you know, people might think tariffs are, are boring, though maybe not after the recent flurry about them. But it's a huge issue in the late 19th century. And 
NAM, you say, is also globalist. It forms in 1895, which is when a lot of things are happening in American political economy. What brings NAM together? Why does it form at that point? And what do you, what do you think it stands for when it starts pulling together? Well, the real uh, thing that brought NAM together was the Depression of 1893. And uh, you know, a lot of historians have written about that, that um, given the, um, the business is going out of, out of business, the collapse of the economy, uh, manufacturing plants closing, the, um, the merging uh, that Naomi Lamoureux writes about, this was a real crisis for the business world. And part of it was that they were all competing against each other. And so there was an interest in the idea of a trade association in terms of how can we come together and cooperate? Um, and in terms, uh, so there was that, and there's a lot of talk in the air about the value of a trade association in terms of, can we cooperate to develop industry rather than to tear industry down by uh, competing against each other? Can we do that? Can we work together as a group to develop industry? So that idea is in the air, um, but the more immediate um, impulse uh, would be because of the 1893 um, depression and the seemingly lack of demand in the United States, manufacturers were very much interested in exporting goods and um, expanding trade. And so the, the real impetus for that was those that, who were interested in, in exports and in opening up a markets, markets abroad and figuring out how, how to do that. Um, it was very difficult without, you know, kind of state-of-the-art communication to figure out how to sell goods in faraway places. You, you know, there are so many um, obstruct barriers to trade, uh, language and uh, tariffs among them. So they um, were trying to figure out a way to cooperate to overcome some of these barriers to trade. They realized that um, most manufacturers in the United States benefited from one barrier to trade, which was the protection uh, this tariff. Um, and so they, they said, well, we don't, we don't necessarily have to lower tariffs at all to expand trade. What we need to do is find countries that are willing um, to trade with us that don't compete with us. And th they developed this idea of reciprocity where um, certain tariffs would be lowered if American goods were allowed to be sold in Argentina, for instance, or Mexico, for instance. And, and so that they developed this idea of reciprocity where we could have the protective tariff, but also um, trade with some countries on some goods that would not uh, threaten or compete with American manufacturers. So this is its origin. I mean, this is important to emphasize that the origin story is not one of focusing on labor, but focusing on commerce, on trade. I mean, the labor part we'll get to in a minute, but that's, you know, and that's its origins. Um, now, to what extent is this an intervention into the business community? I mean, how popular is this idea of, well, let's find a way to engage in foreign trade, and if necessary, find ways to lower some tariffs along the way? Yeah, you know, that is something historians ha have argued about, uh, whether or not it's popular. Um, there was definitely interest in it. And a lot of the uh, manufacturers who were interested in expanding trade joined NAM. But, you know, its membership didn't explode right away. I mean, it, um, you know, it, and, and I should say they had uh, the members are member companies. So companies would sign up hmm. um, and become a part of NAM, they would pour, they would pay dues. Um, so it, there is definitely interest in it. And there's, there's not a lot of opposition as long as, at least in the NAM, I'm not, are you asking me in, in terms of the United States, how popular it was, or in terms of just the manufacturers that were in NAM? I'm thinking more of, of the kind of manufacturers and business interest in the United States. Uh -huh. Because, because I mean, one thing that I've thought about in reading your book is what extent NAM is, yes, of course, it's about policy and politics, but it's also trying to influence business in certain kind of ways. And so I'm wondering here, to what extent is it saying to business, look, 
the tariff, fine. But the future is foreign trade. Mm -hmm. It's it's trying to say that it is absolutely trying to say that I don't um, you know, in terms of how much of an intervention uh, it was, the, the business community seemed um, to welcome them. Um, and it was one of, uh, you know, many organizations. Well, actually, it was the first it, it you know, it is born before the Chamber of Commerce, which is the other major will become its major competitor and ally uh, in in terms of lobbying. And it um, it helped found the Chamber of Commerce. It said this would be interesting. So I think the the bigger intervention that I would be interested or that I emphasize is that it is interested in uh, calling on the U.S. government to help in the expansion of trade, to reform its consulates, uh, to put professional. Um, people who have an eye towards commerce in the consulates rather than just uh, you know someone's someone's friends and the kind of nepotism that existed at the time they really wanted to professionalize the consulate they wanted the United States to um, be be aware of the commercial uh, prospects and interests of other countries that the Nam was interested in so I think the the real um, uh, influence, it had and what it was trying to do was to get the ear of the U.S. government, not so much uh, businesses per se. Right. I, I, I understand. Um, I mean, when you describe this in the book, especially the early period, you say, well, this is why we can call NAM progressive. But you qualify what you mean by progressive. Uh, can you explain that a bit? How in what way you think NAM should be seen as progressive in that in that era. Yeah, um, so part of my saying that is that for anyone who has come across uh, the National Association of Manufacturers in any history, uh, they're always seen as the conservative force. And that's the role they play in most history as well. Conservatives said this, and it's usually and an business said this, and it's a, it's a conservative uh, anti-union uh, perspective, and it's a perspective that is suspicious of government and the New Deal and any kind of regulation. And NAM um, was absolutely that. But at the same time, it, it was also pushing uh, the government to play a larger role in helping to coordinate industry and trade. Um, and so in that sense, it was uh, progressive uh, and progressive in the sense that it was trying to innovate and develop capitalism to make capitalism work. I mean, what 1893 had shown and was that capitalism needed help to work. Uh, you know, the free market by itself could lead to a lot of chaos. And so the NAM was among a number of reform or, or organizations that were working to make capitalism work. Uh, and I would include unions in that as well. It's um, all of a sudden people became aware of the economy as a larger um, entity that might need to be coordinated if it was to work properly. But if you could coordinate and, and figure out how to make it work, it would be incredibly pros prosperous. It would bring so much prosperity. And so there are several organizations uh, that, um, you know, everyone is looking to try to coordinate at that time, including unions with um, with their workers. It's like, yeah, we want a piece of this capitalism too, and but we have to organize in order to get that. So, you know, organization was the the word of the day, and it was the or, the people who were talking about organization and coordination and cooperation uh, in the efforts to develop capitalism were reformers and they were critical of the old laissez-faire idea that you just let the economy run. They, they were not uh, interested in that. So NAM, because it was um, uh, interested in coordinating capitalism and making it work was, I would argue, progressive. And then it continued uh, um, that same role throughout its history in terms of innovation, um, safety features, helping uh, manufacturers adapt to new conditions in the United States. Uh, again, coordinating, sharing information. If we could only share information, um, you know, think how much smoother the economy would work. Very progressive idea. 
you know, that's very much the ideal of the of the trade associations, which you mentioned in the book. I mean, we're not going to go there now, but sort of a larger phenomenon in the early 20th century of these trade associations playing this role of communicating. Some people may know about Louis Brandeis, and there's other great scholarship about this. So this is a I'm just saying to people listening, what, what Jennifer is talking about is part of a larger, if you will be thinking of this period and thinking about how much is a notion of cooperation is part of the business community and elite communities of, the, of that era. Mm -hmm. um, I gotta ask you though about labor. Um, they do get involved in some pretty serious anti-labor stuff, but it is controversial. Why does labor fall into their this globalizing agenda? Is it connected to it or is it a sort of a different tangent or a different set of interests? How does that become tied into NAM? Well, labor is tied into NAM because the manufacturers, the employers are having issues with their employers organizing and demanding rights and demanding wages, but mainly, mainly demanding control. Um, and so that is the story of, of labor unions and you know, really, uh, it's not a surprise that labor unions would become a focus given the fundamental, many what many people regard as a fundamental conflict between the owners of the means of production and the workers. Um, and so they, uh, when, when is it that they become involved in the unions? Um, it's, it's a couple of years in, it's, it's still in the 1890s, uh, and you get this string of really anti-union um, presidents like David Perry, who are manufacturers who've had to deal with workers striking and trying to organize, um, and that becomes a, quite a passion. And I guess one way of looking at it is that that, that does really, um, some historians have argued that that really galvanizes NAM, that companies join. So in, in answer to your earlier question about are companies on board for the, the globalization project, many are. But what really gets companies to join NAM is it's anti-union. It's very strident, um, vocal, vociferous, anti-union rhetoric that equates unions with socialism and um, says, you know, that, that that is that is what what we stand for. Um, and those um, uh, anti union leaders take over very early, like in uh, 1898. Um, and they they reign for that the early 1900s. Um, and their primary um, target is the AFL, the new American uh, Federation of Labor under Gompers. Um, and so there's, you know, historians have said, well, that is what really, you know, yeah, they may have started with globalization, but what really galvanizes the organization and makes it a success and, and puts its name on the map is its anti-union activities. I would say though, that when you look to see when, when NAM makes its anti-union turn, um, when David Perry gets in, there, I'm so bad at with dates. I remember, you know, I think it's like 1902 or something like that where David Perry gets in there. So early, early 1900s. Um, a lot of NAM members are really put off by how anti-union um, David Perry is. He becomes the new president of NAM and, and, and they, you know, and they write and they, they're, they're not at all pleased with this direction. So I don't think, I don't think the anti-union stuff helps globalization. It's, it's something that arises as really the key issue for most American manufacturers. And if you're a manufacturing association, then you're going to deal with unions. Well, I mean, what you're, what you're saying here, what comes across the book is that the, the idea that the main thing about NAM should be fighting unions is in a way to faction. It's there's a there's a, there's a, there's a current. There's an element. It's not just a, it's a big strong current. It's not like a just a little group, um, but it's not necessarily uh, what everyone thinks the the the, the uh, association should be doing. And you describe as well that in the progressive era, there's kind of a pushback against mm -hmm. the if you will the virulently anti-union faction that's there. Mm -hmm. Yes. There, uh, there is a pushback against the unions and uh, or, uh, against the, the really anti-union 
uh, rhetoric. And, and one of the reasons is, I guess, you have to understand the, um, the links that NAM was involved in, in terms of fighting union. I mean, they were really close to actually intervening uh, in hiring thugs and hiring spies and advising companies to hire spies. So they were kind of down in the really, um, you know, in the ditches, uh, fighting unions on the ground. And there were a number of industry leaders who just thought this was unbecoming. This, this, this is not what a manufacturing association should be doing. It's not what a trade association should be doing. It, it had turned into an employer's association, which were using these violent tactics at the time. There were a whole bunch of, um, as you know, in the early 20th century employers associations looking um, you know, to, to keep uh, uh, businesses and manufacturers union free. Um, and so they were looking for ways to address the labor issue that did not involve the kind of fighting on the ground uh, against unions, but involved hiring uh, and developing uh, management as a science that you could use rational methods to address the concerns of the workers and create a more conciliatory relationship between employer and employee. And so those that faction was very much involved in um, developing management as a science through human relations and um, and then advising employers rather than you know sending in spies, maybe they should sit down and talk to their employees about what it is they wanted, have a suggestion box, uh, and work with employ employees to find a more conciliatory common ground. Uh, and so that, that area developed. But they're, they're always, that, um, that really strong stride in anti-unionism still always existed in NAM. The, the NAM at, at no point has ever been in favor of unions. <laughs> that's, that's just been the, the flat line uh, thing across uh, time. So this, I mean, what, again, your story is one of coexistence of these different emphasis and, you know, it kind of waxes and wanes. We'll, we'll pick this up, pick this up later. Um, well, let's move ahead in time. This is where we're talking about the progressive era, the early period there. Um, it sounds like the 1920s was a good decade for NAM, would you say? The era of trade associations and Herbert Hoover and cooperation? Yeah, it was. Um, it, it absolutely was. And although weirdly, and I have to, I didn't, you know, I noticed this after I'd, I'd completed a lot of the books, there is a drop off in membership in the early 1920s that's um, somewhat puzzling and it might be due to, to mergers. Um, but some of the um, issues that will come about in the Great Depression are, are already, you can see, start starting to, to bother the manufacturers. I mean, one of the things I'm doing in this book that's different from the uh, way this story has been told before, it's often told through the lens of big business. Um, and that's because big business is, is very much the leadership of um, NAM. But... I've, I am tried to refocus and recenter manufacturing as a, a sector in the American economy. And so when I'm looking at how is manufacturing doing uh, rather than how are business lobbies doing. Um, and so, yeah, during the 1920s, NAM does seem to be flourishing. They've got uh, American Industries, which is their publication. They're sending people around the world, uh, reporting back about opportunities in the Philippines and opportunities in uh, even uh, China. And they're, um, they're you know, all, all opportunities in South America. They are publishing a lot about safety. So their, their publications are robust in the 1920s. They start to um, expand that they have a, um, in terms of expanding trade, they're doing a lot and helping companies uh, get set up so that they can trade, helping companies navigate their world through, you know, bills of lading and sea routes and uh, exhibition halls, all, all of these things that are necessary to sell your goods abroad. Um, they're doing a lot of that work. 
so they really are leaning into the trade association idea at that time. And also they're really pushing on the globalization yes. elements of NAM, which you've emphasized. And now, you know, now we're, you know, 30 years into the organization and it's still, and it's very strong. Um, mm -hmm. Well, we got to get to the New Deal, Great Depression, because this is what's formed the attitudes towards NAM inside scholarship, especially because mm -hmm. of their role. So what happens then with the New Deal and not just the New Deal, but the New Deal state? How do they deal with the New Deal state when Roosevelt comes in and the strategy of the Great, of dealing with the great Depression changes the way our government operates? Yeah, this is a real crisis. The 1930s are a crisis point for NAM. Uh, it's still a very young organization by then, but it loses like over half its membership just because of the depression. So like manufacturers shut down. Um, so they lose membership because of that. And as they rebuild uh, a couple of the very vocal uh, conservative uh, business leaders um, and it's connected with the DuPont family, um, and allied with the DuPont family, end up taking over the leadership positions in NAM. And they, what they see is they're not, um, you know, in terms of the, the mission, their, um, their business is going to be to oppose the New Deal state, which they see as a revolution, as socialism, as something that threatens their uh, beliefs in uh, individual rights and um, uh uh, the freedom of the market. Uh, so they're very alarmed about Roosevelt and they put a lot of money into public relations campaigns against the New Deal. Uh, and the, the free enterprise campaigns come a little bit later in the later 30s um, and, and certainly in the 1940s, but um, they're doing everything they can. And so they become, they build up, I mean, then they build up a reputation for themselves in the business community as being the first line of defense against uh, an uncontrolled, unregulated state. Um, and, you know, and they, the, and they build a reputation that way, which arguably maybe uh, contributes to bringing corporations and businesses back to them as the economy starts to slowly, very slowly uh, pick up speed again. Well, one thing again you discuss is that they have that opposition. It continues for quite some time, but there's a period of time after World War II where it starts to fade. This is a fade; they're against the needle of state, but they, they start to shift towards, if you would say, an accommodation uh, in a way. Yeah. So, what tell us that about that piece of the story? In, in part, because I think with the New Deal, opposition New Deal. I mean, that's very clear. We got that. But how does that balance in the post-war period? this sort of return to what you have called progressivism or globalism or, or a more nuanced approach towards business interests? Yeah, well, let me clarify a couple of different things. Um, globalization, uh, you know, when you ask me what makes non-progressive, um, I would include in that not just its reform and its attempt to coordinate industry, but globalization itself was seen as um, a you know, liberal, progressive, Wilsonian agenda. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people who spoke for it, um, from Wilson to Cordell Hall, who was um, Roosevelt's uh, Secretary of State, believed that you know if the world traded together, if we knit the world together, if the world became interdependent, that we could avoid war, and that in order to do this, you should get to know other cultures and understand, um, and not and not be overly nationalistic, which, um, you know, is off-putting to other nations. So, you know, to reach out in friendship and cooperation. So that's the other thing I mean about progressive, how the NAM was progressive. But to be clear, there's not a battle between globalist and anti-unionists. That, that's not what I, I'm saying that um, the, many of the globalists are also anti-union. So there's, there's much, um, acceptance and consensus. In fact, that is the only thing that non-members seem to agree on is that <laughs> unions are a bad idea and should be avoided. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's not the, um, the, the real breaking point. And, and I say that because, um, I, just to go back to the 1930s, again, before I go into the post-war world, that um, one of the things that's alarming about the New Deal, of course, is the, the Wagner Act, 
and the basically Roosevelt's invited workers to join a union and said he will protect them. And, and this again, non vociferously, you know, it's, it's apocalyptic. It, it can't even deal with that. Um, and, and they're very, and there's a lot of um, consensus on that issue. One of the things I want to mention, though, about the 1930s before we leave that is even though Nam, you know, hates the Wagner Act and can't abide the New Deal, they are interested in the New Deal's global um, globalization, free trade of policies. The, just to remind people, the Democratic Party at this time has always stood for free trade. Um, you know, way back, you know, from you know, even the 19th century, it's been free trade as opposed to the Republican Party's support of the tariff and protectionism. And that, that was such a crucial fault line in American politics. And so Nam really opposes the New Deal and the whole domestic program that the Democrats come with. But then you've got Cordell Hull, who is saying, you know, look, we need to have reciprocal trade. And basically, Hull is holding up what Nam has long espoused, which is we need to make reciprocal trade deals, bilateral trade deals that won't necessarily disrupt um, the uh, protection of American industries, but would enhance and create opportunities for American industry to expand. And it's the Democrats that end up passing that Reciprocal Trade Act in 1934, and Nam leaders like that, but it's, it's controversial because there are many NAM members that do not support that and see it as uh, a slippery slope to free trade, which of course Cordell Hull is the messiah of free trade. Um, and so the globalist in NAM during the 1930s, you know, yeah, they hate the New Deal and oh, but they really are interested and even help. Um, uh, what do you say, facilitate uh, Cordell Hull's uh, trade policies. So they're very much interested in his trade policy. So the, the Democrats are, are kind of, um, it's, it's a mixed blessing uh, for Nam. I think that because it is, it, it puts itself out there as anti-New Deal, you know, historians have paid attention to that and they should, but then behind the scenes, there is a sizable portion of NAM leadership that really is interested in what Cordell Hull is um, uh, trying to do. And even Roosevelt himself is resistant to some of Hull's free trade ideas because Roosevelt's a politician and, and, um, and it's a very politically charged uh, controversial issue, the idea of lowering tariffs. Um, so, that act passes in 1934. So just, I wanna make sure everyone's got good, that. Good. And, then, uh, and then, and to your question about uh, the post-war world, the post-World War II, um, yes, one of the things that happens um, during the preparation for World War II is NAM's anti-unionism costs it a seat at the table to um, help plan the wartime economy. Because Nam would not agree to any kind of, um, uh, what's it called when unions uh, want everyone to be a union in the- Oh, union? closed shop. Yeah, the closed shop, thank you, thank you. Uh, so Nam doesn't want to agree to the closed shop. It was actually called something different during okay. the war. Actually, the, the policy was called maintenance of membership. Yes, which thank meant, you. Which meant that once a worker joined a union, uh, they couldn't withdraw from the union during the term of the contract. Yes, and that was the term I was looking for. Okay. Uh, it was the, the maintenance of membership uh, part of wartime planning. Other um, uh, business associations uh, that had arisen, um, you know, I, th I think uh, in response to NAM or they, you know, so like the business uh, council that realized that businesses could actually profit from a lot of New Deal policies, that businesses, if there was a stable labor uh, order, that, that would actually benefit um, corporations as well as workers. And so those um, corporate leaders, often called corporate leaders, uh, were interested in 
signing on during the war to maintenance of uh, membership. And by opposing that so vociferously, Nam gave up a leadership position and it sat out the war and, and they had to accept all this stuff that this liberal competing business association was working out with the, uh, the government. And so there were Nam leaders uh, at the time who noticed this and said, you know, we've got to be more cooperative because if we're, if we're so anti everything, we give up our influence as a trade association and as a lobbyist. So we need to have a more cooperative, um, a positive attitude towards working with the government. And th those guys take over uh, at the end of World War II and they do bring in a more um, a cooperative attitude. They realize they're, you know, they've just seen what, uh, how prosperous and how productive the American economy can be if business and government cooperate. Good Lord, you could look what we did. We just won a war. We just produced a massive amount of weaponry and we coordinated it all and we, we got the war won. Um, maybe there's some uh, economic value for business if we try to have a more conciliatory attitude towards the government. And so they um, take over and um, I don't know if you were going to be leading to the Taft-Hartley Act, but that is one of the results of this moderate takeover of NAM. Well, just say quickly about that. I mean, there's, there's a lot to cover, but you want to argue that Taft-Hartley was actually, a, a, if you will, a break in NAM's anti-unionism, which is not usually the way it's portrayed. Mm -hmm. um, explain why. Why do you think that it's not the kind of continuation of this sort of virulent anti-unionism that's often pictured in the literature? Yeah, and you know there is there is an argument to be made that this is just Nam being anti-union all over again. Um, so I, I don't want to say that that's wrong, but I don't think that Nam would have been able to get um, the act passed um, or the Republicans <laughs> had the Nam not cooperated in really bringing businesses around to signing on to it. And so the reason I think it's the moderates that are responsible for the passage of that act. Um, it's still obviously an anti-union act, but what it does is it ends up, when businesses sign the Taft-Hartley Act, they've agreed to the Wagner Act. All the Taft-Hartley does is uh, limit parts of the Wagner Act that hadn't um, been limited. So it is, it's, it's um, says what, labor unions can't do. So the Wagner Act tells us what businesses can't do with regard to labor unions. The Taft-Hartley Act says what unions can't do with regard to uh, corporations. So a lot of the real ultra conservative people in NAM think that by signing on to the Taft-Hartley Act, they've basically acquiesced in legalizing unions in the United States basically institutionalizing them, accepting the leadership of the National Labor Relations Board. All of this is um, codified and affirmed in the Taft-Hartley Act. And there were conservatives in NAM who thought that we could just completely overturn the Wagner Act and take government out of the business of labor relations altogether. Government has no business telling us how to regulate our workforces. It has no business setting up this neighbor, labor relations board that gets to determine these things. That's not the government's role. And so the real ultra conservative anti-union people in NAM um, are, what they want to do is not have, you know, just get rid of the entire ap legal apparatus around unions. Taft-Hartley solidifies the legal apparatus around unions and it creates a consensus um, of sorts. Uh, labor unions have their rights, employers have their rights, and this makes labor unions a fact of American industry. And that was the moderate position. The moderate position is, look guys, unions are here to stay. We should uh, agree to that and try to get our interest met on that. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna to bargain to get a better deal vis-a-vis -vis the, the whole union situation. If we keep saying no to unions, the union train's gonna leave the station, but we're not gonna have any influence about what it, 
what happens. So that's why I argue, I don't know if that makes sense to you, but that's why I argue that the moderates are, um, it's actually a much more moderate bill than uh, what some non-members wanted to have. Well, I, th I think it's very important to think about it. It's also true that unions reached their height of membership in 1955, which is some years after Taft-Hartley. So that's something to consider, but let's keep on moving. But part of this churn too, one, one thing I wanna, I wanna make sure we talk about is around the time we get to 47 and in the 50s, um, there's agitation around civil rights that is beginning. And certainly, you know, Tom Segru writes about the long civil rights movement. It's going on. It's wartime and afterwards. And you have a lot to say about NAM's place in thinking about civil rights, especially in a workplace and business setting. Uh, tell us what you have, what you think about with that. Yeah. So to understand this, I... You know, it would be wrong to say that NAM is a <laughs> pro civil rights, but they see civil rights as, um, first of all, what civil rights does by uh, endorsing individual right to work, <laughs> which is what the Fair Employment Act is, is saying that individuals have a right to work. Um, they see it as a dig against the collectivism of unions and they see it as a dig against the closed shop because the unions notoriously the, especially the closed shops uh exclude black workers so there's an opportunity here for nam to support black workers um on the basis of civil rights and and again their understanding of civil rights are individual rights. And so they're very interested in individual rights because it's tied to property rights and it's tried to free to free markets. So for them, that's, well, obviously, uh, uh, Black people are people who have rights. Um, but when they say that, that doesn't mean they're, you know, joining uh, hands, certainly not with A. Philip Randolph or, or really any of the, um, the fair employment people, but um, they are interested in, they don't, they don't oppose fair employment. That's the, I guess that's the best that can be said here, but you would expect them to oppose fair employment laws. And these are laws that um, states and, uh, and civil rights workers are fighting for that prohibit discrimination in industry. And they don't, they don't love, they don't like the government um, intervention into the labor market, which this suggests. So they're not in favor of that, but they do believe, and so they do believe that black people should be allowed to be employees. And in fact, have advised many of their companies about how to hire black people because for them, it's a labor market issue. And if you add black people, you expand the labor pool. And if you expand the labor pool, you get away, you can use that again against unions. And it, it just also helps uh, industry to have the most uh, you know, available labor available as possible. So they are interested in supporting programs that help educated black uh, workers and help train them. Uh, and in, in part, because a lot of unions don't support black apprenticeship programs because they're trying uh, unions are trying to guard the apprenticeship programs. So there's um, a logic that is not I don't want anyone to think that I'm arguing <laughs> that NAM is pro civil rights in the way that we typically understand that, but they're not opposed to it and they see um, the ways that it can damage and hinder unions both materially, if there are more black workers available, if there are more workers available, that damages unions, but also in terms of, of public relations. Um, they're always uh, wanna kind of push, uh, you know, anything they can to um, uh, shame labor unions, they will use. I mean, one thing you, you trace is how this extends to support for affirmative action mm -hmm. in which business is usually portrayed as against affirmative action and you're, you trace a different story. What happens with affirmative action? And, and it extends for a long time, well into the 80s. They are very firm on this point. Yeah. Uh, so during the 1960s and the civil rights movement, um, the Civil Rights Act, again, the NAM did not oppose the Civil Rights Act. Many 
members, it has a lot of conservative uh, members in its organization. And they often spoke vociferously against civil rights uh, movement, but the leadership did not at this point uh, speak against civil rights, uh, the bill. They tried to lobby, again, they're, they're in this, by the 1960s, by 1964, NAM is in this more moderate leadership with its more moderate leadership. And they certainly tried to influence the Civil Rights Act so that it wouldn't have such a huge impact on manufacturers, but they never opposed it and it passed. And even before it passed, they were busy organizing workshops about how manufacturers are, would comply with the Civil Rights Act, which prohibited uh, discrimination on the basis of race, color, or nationality uh, and uh, uh, gender. And th they right away, even before it passed, said to their, ma their members, look, you know, <laughs> if you don't want the government, the strong arm of government to come down on you to regulate you, you should probably start integrating your plants now. And we offer workshops on how to do that. So they uh, sponsored a lot of research and a lot of workshops um, about how to hire and integrate plants. And th that was something I wrote about earlier in my earlier book that business, you know, a lot of business, not a lot, some businesses <laughs> were uh, interested in doing this uh, to expand the labor pool and realized that it's something that you just can't do, but it takes um, pr professional management to introduce these policies into uh, a, a workplace. And so they sponsored all of that almost as if they knew the Civil Rights Act was going to pass and they were just trying to get their members ready. And so that ties in very much to their trade association work of helping businesses and manufacturers and their members to adapt to new legal and political realities. And, and that's what they did. Um, as the Civil Rights Act con uh, continued and uh, civil rights activists were boycotting and making more demands from the government, um, the Civil Rights Act was not enough. All the Civil Rights Act did was uh, prohibit discrimination. There are all kinds of reasons that were barriers to white employers hiring black people that had nothing to do with overt discrimination. And all of that continued. This is what we call structural racism. Uh, there were tests, there were policies like you hired, employers always hired the friends and neighbors of existing employees because that's the cheapest way to hire people. Um, so, and that wasn't done to exclude black workers, but the effect of that was to exclude black workers. There were various tests that had to be done. Unions had seniority uh, issues uh, of who could be promoted, had to be in the union. So there were all kinds of barriers to the um, hiring and promotion of black workers that had nothing to do with the overt discrimination that was prohibited by the Civil Rights Act. And so civil rights act um, activists and, uh, and also uh, people in the governments uh, tried to like, well, how do we actually get companies to hire black people? And so there's a long history of um, working through the uh, president's uh, committee on hiring. Uh, these are uh, the or various presidents had uh, committees on equal opportunity that, uh, and notably John Kennedy, who is the first president that's associated with the term affirmative action. And he had a, an executive order that said um, um, employers needed to take affirmative action to hire black people if they wanted government contracts. That was something at the time Democrats understood they were never going to be able to get the Civil Rights Act through Congress, but they could do steps through executive order in terms of government contracts. And so NAM was already working on the government with those because many of the government contractors were in NAM. And, um, and the federal government said, we're, we're actually going to cut you off from valuable defense contracts if you do not show that you are in compliance with hiring black workers, a certain number. And so the affirmative action is developed in the context of this, these executive orders and these presidential committees. And NAM sends people to consult with these um, uh, government committees. 
And in order, again, to be clear, NAM is always trying to get the best deal for the employers. But by engaging in a discussion and a negotiation, they're endorsing the concept of affirmative action, and which is, and at this point, what affirmative action looks like uh, is you'll uh, recruit at black colleges, um, you'll uh, look at black apprenticeship programs, maybe you'd set, set up apprenticeship programs for black workers. There are a couple of other experiments that uh, people are doing, but by, uh, by the late 1960s with the, um, the riots uh, in the streets and um, increased uh, black radicalism around this issue uh, and the Vietnam War, the government um, is, def is taking even stronger steps. And that's when you start to see the, something called the Philadelphia Plan, which is a type of affirmative action that says a certain number. So it's not enough anymore just to recruit at colleges or just to change union seniority prod, uh, um, policies. You now have to have a certain number of black workers that is equal or represents the number of black people in the community. And you have to show that. And you have to set up goals and timetables to when you're going to get there. And Working out all of that, NAM is very much present in doing that. They're trying to make it the more um, acceptable and easiest for their co member companies to comply with these new policies. So that they're constantly going to be negotiating from the employer's perspective. But at the end of the day, they're a part of that negotiation and they end up um, forming affirmative action. NAM's hope is if they support these affirmative action policies, they will remain um, voluntary. And so it it's always says to its members, here's what you need to do voluntarily, because if you do this voluntarily, you won't be vulnerable to a civil rights suit and you won't be vulnerable from the federal government. The federal government's not gonna take away your, your contract. So you need to do this voluntarily. And so their focus is in encouraging companies to adopt affirmative action policies voluntarily. They oppose these policies becoming written in law, uh, which affirmative action is never written in law. It's always a government policy. Um, and it's a government policy that NAM had a quite a bit of, um, uh, uh, influence in um, creating. And it continues to create affirmative action even during the Reagan administration when the Reagan administration and the conservatives uh, want to pull back on it. Uh, NAM is among many business communities that uh, want to keep it. And the, just to be clear, the reason they want to keep it is because it does protect them against lawsuits. So they, they end up on the right side, not necessarily for virtue, but for the interest of a trade association, the interest of business pushed them in this direction. Yes. Well, let me steer this back towards globalization um, because we're now in the 80s with, yes. with the story there. And your story is one of how, by the time we get to the 80s, 90s, aughts, um, NAM has aligned with the Democrats in many ways in this sort of global world even as this globalization results in imports, which devastate some of the companies that NAM has as members. It's, mm -hmm. You present this almost as a, as, a, as a paradox in a way. And it is a paradox, you know, how they, you know, why they do this. So can you expand on, explain how this happens that this, this global agenda, it, it kind of wins, but it's one of these things where careful what you ask for, you might get it. It's what it sort of sounded like to me. Yeah, and you know, I struggled with how, how to portray this because it, it really is puzzling. They are, um, it, again, I'm looking at this in terms of manufacturing. So they're a trade association who's supposed to be looking after the interest of manufacturers. They end up supporting um, a lot of policies, uh, financial policies and uh, trade policies that encourage um, the offshoring of manufacturing to low wage regions um, and that basically end up shuttering factories in the United States. So we know the story of deindustrialization in the United States. In many ways, it's non-support of global policies 
um, that bring that on. It's not the only thing, but you know, that's NAM embraces those policies, even at the same time as they hurt the, their member companies. And the way the NAM um, at the time deals with this is they try to encourage their small member companies to start exporting. And so when they support, like they support the export import bank, they support, there are all these acronyms, I can't remember what they stand for, but OPEC and not OPEC, the oil thing, but OPEC, the <laughs> opportunities abroad for trading type organization. So there are all these kind of public private uh, organizations uh, and programs that NAM supports to encourage export, the export trade, because they're, that is the hope for them. If, if, if um, the world is changing and Japanese and German competitors are now uh, importing goods into the United States, the best thing that industry can do is export. So we are encouraging export policies. And not only that, we're teaching our small number members how to take advantage of these opportunities. And so in their publications and in their pamphlets, there's, uh, they're, they're making an effort to let small manufacturers know that if you wanna get in on the deal, you've gotta start exporting, you've gotta start exporting. So that, that's how they deal with it. And they're doing that in the sense of a trade association, as I said, a progressive trade association that's helping its members deal with something that is inevitable. And so from the globalist perspective, globalization is inevitable. If the United States doesn't get out there and start making trade deals with China, for instance, the Europeans will, and they'll crush us. So we've got to get out there. We have got to be trading with China, and China is going to make some demands that aren't necessarily going to you know, help our membership. But if we are just to withdraw from the world completely, we're not doing our job either. So we need to be there. We need to be opening trade with China. We need to be um, negotiating with China, even if it means that we're losing, um, we're making bad deals that are going to hurt American companies. Because if we don't, everyone else will, and we'll miss the train. And so that is that element of progressivism. They think it's inevitable, and um, we're doing what we can by helping our members adapt. And in the 1990s, that's what they really start doing. They help their members adapt. They help them downsize their corporation, their factories. They help them find their place in the global supply chain. They um, uh, help them uh, become more productive. They help them uh, not just, they downsize through automation. Uh, NAM helps uh, companies adopt this new automated machinery. Uh, and helps them adapt to the new world of globalization, which actually does help them regain members. So they try to lead their people through. Yes. Even as even as there are, there are losses in the way. Uh, well, let me bring this to a close, but I want to ask you about a final question. Of course, when you talk about globalization, you can't avoid the presidency of Donald Trump. You comment on there. But something happens after your book ends which is very interesting, and some people know about this, which is in, you know, in January 6, 2021, as we know, there is an insurrection at the, uh, you know, the Capitol, and Nam comes out and makes some statements about the election and about what happens. What does Nam say about the, the whole election controversy and about that insurrection? Uh, Nam disowns it and, and says uh, it's uh, completely inappropriate um, and um, condemns it and, and condemns Trump for encouraging it. And in some ways, it's, um, it's shocking to see because Nam is still fa fairly regarded as a Republican or you know, most of its membership is Republican. Uh, and, but it, it comes out hard against Trump and the senators uh, who do not support the election. Uh, and see it as undermining American democracy. It's a really strong statement. And not only that, it was the first, uh, certainly the first business um, group that came out against uh, the insurrection and also tied it to Trump. And part of that is, you know, 
the Trump administration had been kind of um, a thorn in the side of NAM. On the one hand, Trump came promising to revive American manufacturing. And so NAM obviously is, it supports manufacturing. So it's gotta be on board with what Trump is doing. But Trump's actions, and particularly uh, with regard to immigration and uh, the tariffs with China, um, actually hurt manufacturing. And so they, they were constantly navigating this rhetoric of Trump helping uh, American manufacturers, but also the new, the new reality that NAM had helped to create uh, which was American manufacturers hooked into global supply chains, Trump was not helping, Trump was hurting. So it now was in a very tricky situation there. Of course, it supported um, Trump's tax cuts, obviously, uh, never, um, so it supported that. But on issues of trade, it was um, not in support of what Trump was doing. And Jay Timmons, who is the current head of NAM, also spoke out um, about Nam's immigration, uh, uh, about Trump's anti-immigration uh, and wanted to work with the Trump administration to get uh, a fair uh, legal immigration that would bring talented American workers into the United States. Um, so yeah, um, it, it, to me, it's really interesting that Trump was something that the globalist did not anticipate. And I don't think most of us Americans uh, and, uh, anticipated something like Trump. I think uh, Trump and his bringing back the tariff, you know, that talk of tariff, you know, whenever I teach tariffs in class, it's like, it's so 19th century. It's like, why am I even talking about this anymore? And then all of a sudden it's like in the news and everyone wants to know what tariffs are about. Well, it speaks to the importance of globalization and the issue as somebody that you know, animates NAM, which uh, Jennifer traces in her book. So I hope you all go out and get it. And I'm sure we'll be hearing Jennifer commenting periodically as, as this is an ongoing story. NAM exists. They continue to bring their records to Hagley. And there's more to be said about it. So Jennifer, thank you for, for chatting with us, talking yeah. about this. Thank you, Roger.